Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you. God, we thank you. God, we invite more of you. Not just into this room, but into our hearts, into our lives, Lord God. You are the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Hallelujah. That's what I'm hearing the Lord say also is, I am the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for always being there for us, Lord God. You are our ever-present help in time of trouble. God, help us to remember the valley even when we're having mountaintop experiences, God. God, I don't want to just press into you when we're, when everything is going bad. I want to press into you when everything is going good. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Help us to not take you for granted, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, even when our sound system, our recording is imbalanced, Lord God, we praise you that we have these things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It sounds good here, even if it doesn't sound as good on the live stream. The music sounds really good here. <laughs> so that means... If you're watching online, you just need to come live. You know, there's a live stream that's happening in the house of God. It's not the same as just watching online. It's not the same thing. If that's all you can do, then that's fine. But I'm conflicted about live, live church. It's good for reaching a widespread It's a good widespread net, but there's nothing like the assembling of ourselves together. It's so needed. And I don't ever want it to become someone's excuse to not come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So the Lord gave me a word, but it's also, like most of the words he gives me, it's intermingled with his word. So, a lot of people are in a transitioning kind of step. And we can spiritualize that and call it the birthing process. And I don't want to jump ahead of what the Lord gave me here, but it's it, this is a this is a, a word that's not, not just for the people that go here or the people of Augusta, for that matter, or the people of Georgia. This is, I felt like this was a word for, for the whole body. It's, it's, a, it's very general, but sometimes we need those general words. So the Lord has been talking to me a lot about this one thing, and it's, and it's, not, it's not necessarily what I would consider a pleasant word, you know. And I, I never want to consider myself as someone that, prophesies doom and gloom or any of that stuff but 
you got to speak what the Lord is saying. You can't just prophesy peace when the Lord is saying it's it's that's not the time we're in. That's not the season that we're in. So I hear so many people saying that it's about to get really good. It's about to get better. And as much as I want to believe that, and I believe there are seasons of that, and financial turnaround and all the stuff, the Lord is showing me something that might be hopefully after that, <laughs> but he's showing me something that's completely different than that. And it may be I'm seeing he's showing me something that's years ahead, or maybe it's right around the corner. <laughs> So he was talking to me about the next step. What is the next step? If y'all want to turn with me, I'm going to be, there's a few scriptures, but I'm mainly going to be coming out of Matthew 24. But first, I'm going to be in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, chapter 5, verse 3. And mainly out of the Amplified, but this is the ESV. So, thank you, Lord. And First Thess- Thessalonians five three says, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The Lord is showing me. We are still in the birth pains, the travailing. We need prayer warriors to rise up in this hour. It's time to get back to the foundations, the very bedrock of our faith. A lot of churches like to put on a show for intercessory prayer, but God doesn't necessarily want a big showcase. The Father wants real. He desires our whole hearts. We are to serve the Lord with all of our being. Just as the word says, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, and all your strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I talk to so many believers, and we are in danger of becoming more and more feelings-based. Sometimes the messages that God wants to be delivered can absolutely be demonstrative and even look odd at times, but we need balance. We need discernment. Let's see what the Word says. And these are the very words of Jesus, the red letters of the King of Kings. And this is where I believe the Holy Spirit revealed to me with regards to where we are at and what we are coming into. So if y'all want to follow along, uh, I'm going to be out of Matthew 24, the whole chapter, because it's all applicable, and I'm reading out of the Amplified. Thank you, Lord. So it starts off by saying, Jesus left the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the magnificent and massive buildings of the temple. That's where our human eyes go, right? Look how cool that looks. That's very impressive in the natural looking. That, that stuff doesn't impress God at all. I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. What looks good to our eyes doesn't necessarily look good to God's eyes, and that's throughout Scripture. We, who we look at for a king or a, a president or whatever, we're looking at natural like that guy looks the part, and God looks at the heart. He picked David, who was the runt of the litter, not any of his brothers, and his dad didn't even prayed at all the brothers out, and, and, di- and it was like, I have no other sons. But David was the runt of the litter that was picked. And even even the prophet, even Samuel, who was there, said, surely this is the one. The Lord spoke to him and said, no, that is not the one. I don't have that written down, so God, feel free to use my voice. (laughs) And he said to them, this is Jesus' response to the apostles to be, do you see all these things? I assure you, 
and most solemnly say to you, not one stone here will be left on another which will not be torn down. This is one of the things they brought up at his trial, too, saying he spoke blasphemy by talking about tearing the temple down. That's not blasphemy <laughs> to talk about tearing down a building. That, that's not even comes close to the definition of the word blasphemy. And historically, this did happen back around 70 AD. But prophetically, I believe Jesus is letting us know that the traditions of men will crumble altogether in the near future. And while Jesus was sit, seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will this destruction of the temple take place? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That means the completion or the consummation. Kind of like a marriage is consummated. So let me tell you, they thought the, the second coming, Jesus was with them in the first coming. And during that time, they thought he's coming again soon. Like he's only going to leave for maybe a few days, hopefully, and then he's going to be right back. And, and technically, he did that. Technically, he was gone. He went and got the keys to hell and the grave. And then he was back three days later, wasn't he? So they weren't wrong. I've heard so many people say, well, they were technically wrong. They thought he was coming back right then and there, but he did come back right then and there. So they weren't wrong. They were feeling and discerning the times in their spirits, but they were referring to him coming back and taking over the world. But still, they weren't, they were partially right, right? Amen? So tell us, when will this take place? Isn't that what we all want to know? If we knew the day the master would return, wouldn't we be waiting with our lamps lit, ready to go, watching, waiting, prepared? Wouldn't they, don't, they wanted to know the time just like we want to know the time. And that isn't to say that the time isn't growing nearer. We are getting a day closer every day. But... We are to be watchers on the wall. We are supposed to be watchmen. We are all supposed to be watchmen. We are supposed to be waiting in anticipation with eagerness. As, and then we are supposed to be gathering so much more so as we see the day approaching. Online church doesn't count for assembly. It's, it's not a bad thing, but it's not the best thing. For many will come. This is Jesus. For many will come in my name, misusing it and appropriating it, the, the strength of the name which belongs to me, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, and they will mislead many. You will continually hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, and that is not yet the end of the age. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, of the intolerable anguish in the time of the unprecedented trouble. That means it hasn't taken place before, trouble like this that's coming. I preached this same message... The Lord gave me about four years ago is very similar, not exactly the same. He showed me that as the time of the end draws ever closer, that the real pains will come in quicker and quicker succession, just like that of a woman in labor. The pain gets all the more intolerable until that baby is birthed. This is prophetically what real intercessory prayer should also be like, not a show, not a social gathering, but a gathering for a distinct purpose. Jesus continues by saying, Then they will hand you over to endure tribulation and will put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Hated. Hated. That's interesting, isn't it? 
interesting. But I hear all the time people think that the church is called to, to be, be like the world to, to be able to witness to them. That's not at all what the Bible tells us. We are called to be different, set apart. The word is sanctified. We aren't, we are called to not be like the world, in fact. At that time, many will be offended. Can somebody can, r- repeat that for me? At that time, many will be offended. offended. Offended? Is that the day and age that we're living in now? Does anybody get offended? It seems like everybody gets offended by just about everything. The world would call that narcissistic if you can't correct someone. At that time, many will be offended and repelled by their association with me. This is Jesus talking. And will fall away from the one whom they should trust. And will betray one another, handing over believers to their persecutors, and will hate one another. This is referring to the Greek word apostasia, which is a, which is a word that means revolt, rebellion, or defection. It is where the word apostasy is derived from. Second Thessalonian states, Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That is the great rebellion or the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. He is the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed. Hallelujah. (laughs) who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called God or object of worship so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. That is like the height of hubris right there. Now again, back to Jesus' words in Matthew 24. Many false prophets will appear and mislead many. Many false prophets will appear and mislead many. Contrary to popular belief, the biblical definition of a false prophet is one that is self-seeking about their own glory and their pro-sin. Think hyper-grace preacher saying it's okay to still be in our sinful nature or in iniquity and still be saved. That's not what the Bible says. Repent means change. We can't be saved and drink from the cup of demons. We can't drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. If I told you otherwise, I would be a false prophet. I would be a false preacher, whatever you want to call it. I would be false if I didn't tell you the truth. I would be an ear tickler. The Bible also says they're ear ticklers. They tell you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. But because lawlessness is increased, does that sound like today? The love of most people will grow cold or wax cold. Their hearts will get harder. But the one who endures and bears up under suffering to the end will be saved. Praise God. This good news of the kingdom, the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. Then the end of the age will come. And then the end of the age will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation, the appalling sacrilege that astonishes and makes desolate, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains for refuge. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Think of, think of uh, Lot's wife looking back and becoming a pillar of salt. Don't look back. Keep your hand to the plow and do not look back at your old life. I, I, I like the saying that there's a, when we're driving a vehicle, you have a rear view mirror just to look back just briefly enough 
to say, man, I used that my life used to be garbage. Thank you, God, and keep moving forward. And that should be the only time we look back for testimonial purposes only. Because there will not be enough time to amplify, it says. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. And woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight from persecution and suffering will not be in winter or on a Sabbath when Jewish laws prohibited travel. For at that time, there will be a great tribulation, that is pressure, distress, oppression, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. And if those days of tribulation had not been cut short, no human life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, that is God's chosen ones, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you during the great tribulation, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear, and they will provide great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Listen carefully. I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out there. Or look, he is in the inner rooms of a house. Do not believe it. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as, as, as the west, so will be the coming in glory of the Son of Man, praise God. Everyone will see him clearly. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will flock together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not provide its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And at that time, the sign of the son of man coming in his glory will appear in the sky. Just Jesus, before he left, he said, so will my coming be just the same way he ascended. He will descend from on high from the clouds of Shekinah glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It will appear in the sky. And when all the tribes, then all the tribes of the earth, and especially Israel, will mourn, regretting their rebellion and rejection of the Messiah, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and brilliance and splendor. It's just like when he left. It's going to come back in the same manner. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, God's chosen ones, from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its young shoots become tender and it puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things taking place, know for certain that he is near, right at the door. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, this generation, the people living when these signs and events begin, will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth, as now known, will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But, as, but at, of that exact day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son in his humanity, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man, the Messiah, will be just like the days of Noah. Some gospels say Noah and Lot. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the very day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know or understand until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be unexpected judgment. Let me pause and break that down. That means everything is going to be going like normal, according to the world. They're going to be blind, and they're going to think, oh, you think Jesus is coming soon? Another, another uh, thing says scoffers will come. There will be many scoffers. They're basically going to be like, they've been saying Jesus is coming back for 2,000 years. And they don't realize that they're fulfilling prophecy when you do that. 
I'm telling you, we're getting so close. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Just like a woman in labor. I don't think we've seen half the iceberg yet. It's going to get it's going to get really bad because it's going the Lord told me this. My church is still sleeping. And it's going to take tribulation to wake them up. Because we're lazy. We are lazy. We are lackadaisical, myself included. We are naturally not wanting I'm I don't want to go off the the other side of the scale saying it's it's not a works based gospel that I preach. I preach that we are saved by faith, but then when we're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, we will want to do works. We aren't saved by the works as some, uh, I'm just going to say it, the Catholics believe we are saved by the works that we do. That is not what the Bible says, but it is the evidence of our faith. That is what the Bible says. So we are not saved by the works that we do. We don't work we do work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but we aren't saved by works, any works. Only the works that Jesus did are we saved. It is through faith in Jesus alone, and it is his grace that leads us through the process. Grace does cover our sins, but only when we surrender to God in all of his glory, and he washes our sin away. At that time, two men will be in the field. One will be taken for judgment, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken for judgment, and one will be left. So be alert. Give strict attention. Be cautious and active in faith. For you do not know which day, whether near or far, that your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you who follow me must also be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give the others in the house their food and supplies at the proper time? Blessed is that faithful servant when his master returns and finds him doing so. I assure you and most solemnly say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant is evil and says in his heart, my master is taking his time, he will not return for a long while and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour of which he is not aware and will cut him in in two and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding or gnashing of teeth over distress and anger. Talking about throwing people in hell. Hell is still a real place. Hallelujah. I didn't get the address of this next scripture, but I think it's, I went back to 2 Thessalonians or maybe 1 Thessalonians. It's talking about the man of lawlessness. Now in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to meet him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly unsettled or alarmed either by a so-called prophetic revelation of a spirit or a message or a letter alleged to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. This is referred to as a millennialism or preterism. This is saying that Jesus already came, that stuff already happened, that in the book of Revelation already happened. That is not true. You can read right here. It's saying... Basically, disregard all those guys, they're heretics. <laughs> Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, 
That is, that great rebellion, the abandonment of our faith by professed Christians. You see how Scripture is always pointing back to Scripture? It sounds like I'm rereading the same thing, and I'm not. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist who's going to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently above every so-called God or object of worship. Now, this part I did read before, this one little snippet. So that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now from being revealed. It is so that he will be revealed at his own appointed time. For the mystery of lawlessness, that is rebellion against divine authority, and the coming reign of lawlessness is already at work. This was 2,000 years ago. But it is restrained by the Holy Spirit. Only until he who now restrains it is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. And it's my belief, because the Bible also says Antichrist, Antichrist everywhere. It's a spirit of Antichrist, but Satan always has an Antichrist figure ready. Because he doesn't know the day or the hour. Hitler could have been an Antichrist archetype. But there's going to be this one Antichrist that comes on the scene that... The Bible talks about a false prophet, who I believe is the Pope, (laughs) is going to come and hand him and point to him. And it's going to be some kind of political figure, probably somebody that's very suave and debonair. And he's going to come and he's going to, when the world is is, is in complete and utter turmoil, and he's going to have a solution for the peace. And it's not going to be Jesus. His solution is going to be of the world. It's going to be him. He's going to point the way. And it's not going to be the way to Jesus, which is the only true way. He is antichrist. There is an antichrist coming. Might even be on the world, alive in the world today. Then that lawless one will be revealed. And the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth doesn't he could blink and he'd be gone and bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming the coming of the antichrist the lawless one is through the activity of satan attended with great power all kinds of counterfeit miracles and deceptive signs and false wonders all of them are lies and by unlimited seduction to evil and with all the deception of wickedness for those who are perishing Because they did not welcome the love of the truth of the gospel so as to be saved. They were spiritually blind and rejected truth that would have saved them. Because of this, God will send upon them a misleading influence, an activity of error and deception. So they will believe the lie in order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe the truth about their sin and the need of salvation through Christ but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. But we should and are morally obligated as debtors always to give thanks to God for you, believers beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through the sanctifying work of the Spirit that sets you apart for God's purposes by your faith in the truth of God's Word that leads you to spiritual maturity. Everybody say spiritual maturity. That sounded, there was a lot of gusto behind that. Spiritual maturity. It was to the to this end, and he called you through our gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, so that you may obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold tightly to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved and given us everlasting comfort and encouragement and the good, well-founded hope of salvation, by his grace, comfort, and encourage and strengthen your hearts by keeping them steadfast on course, right? We've got to be on course, the right course, in every good work and word. 
I have to warn you. This is me, not the Bible. I have to warn you. For the past year, the Lord has been talking to me about persecution. That it's going to take that persecution to shake up the body of Christ. I've said this before. Just like the persecuted church in the book of Revelation, Shmirna. God will use the crushing process so that his anointing will flow freely out of us. We must be crushed to be used by him. Our flesh does not like being put to death. But it must be crucified so we can fully be used by God. We must die to our own wants and our own desires, pick up our cross, and follow him. Not my will, not our will collectively, but his, but yours be done, Lord. To be a real Christ follower, which is what Christian means, is no easy thing. It's harder the more resistant we are to the process. Our old man will try to creep back up, so we need to be surrounded by real believers. Even leaders need accountability. I'll tell you the truth. Being in a ministry office means you live in a glass house, a glass home with everyone watching you. All eyes are on you, looking for every error. It is not for the faint of heart. Praise God. If you step into that calling too early before you are supposed to, then you will surely fail. That doesn't mean we can't minister. But um, I, I view, the way I view ministry offices is they, they fully have at least the discernment part down. Because that's, that's a big, big sign of maturity. I hear the devil speak. I just tell him to shut up. Uh, you know? I quit believing that, his, that those thoughts belong to me when his demons whisper to me. It's, it's not something I learned overnight. We need to realize that most of the thoughts we have when we're starting out, coming out of the world, aren't, they don't belong to us. We're to disassociate ourselves from those old thoughts. When we start feeling a certain type of way that doesn't agree with God's word, we command our body and we crucify, we mortify our flesh so that it becomes what God's word says. We prophesy it over our body by, by telling it what to do. Your body doesn't want to get up to 5 a.m. to pray. Your body doesn't want to do that fast. Your body doesn't want to go out and evangelize because that's an uncomfortable place. Tell your testimony to a coworker. Don't want to do that. What if you get in trouble? These things are things that we're called to do. They are like that's like 101 Christianity. Um, turn with me to Hebrews. I'm on a coffee fast, and i got to read Hebrews. Um, I believe, uh, help, somebody help me out. These are the elementary things of the faith. What, what chapter of Hebrews? I don't have internet on this tablet. Hmm? I just said it. Yeah, somebody Google that real quick. He okay, six one Hebrews Hebrews six verse one. Okay. <laughs> it's not on. Yeah. There we go. It's 6 1. There we go. And th hey, 
and this is, uh, I didn't get the address, but this is, this goes right along with what we were teaching, and I didn't have this in mind. Hey, sweetie. The, the title of Hebrews 6 is The Peril of Falling Away. Tell me that's not the Lord right there. I didn't even have this on the agenda. Hebrews 6.1 starts out, Therefore, let us get past the elementary stage in the teachings about the Christ, advancing on to the maturity and perfection and spiritual completeness, doing this without laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of teachings about washings, which are ritual purifications, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are all important matters in which you should have been proficient long ago. And we will do this, that is, proceed to maturity, if God permits, for it is impossible to restore to repentance those who have once been enlightened spiritually and who have tasted and consciously experienced the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted and consciously experienced the good word of God and the powers of the age, the world to come, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to bring them back again to repentance, since they, they again nail the Son of God on the cross. For as far as they are concerned, they are treating the death of Christ as if it, they were not saved by it, and are holding him up again to public disgrace. For soil that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces crops useful to those who have benefit, it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God, but it if it persistently produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. All right, so back at the beginning, breaking that down, it says elementary things. What does the word elementary mean? Basic. First things. So elementary school is the first things you learn. What are some of the first things we learn, it says? Raising the dead. <laughs> Laying on of hands. And that, that's implying healing. Go out and heal the sick, Jesus said. We can't do it. Once we get out of ourselves, we realize, oh, it's God doing the healing when we pray for people. It's God resurrecting when we pray for people. Oh, God can't use me. What? He said he could. You're making God a liar. That simple. You don't believe God can raise the dead through you? You don't believe God. You don't believe God can heal through you? You don't believe God. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but we need to do these works. Again we're, again, we're not saved by the works, but they are evidences. Jesus himself said, these signs follow all who believe in him. What are they? Cast out demons. They are speaking new tongues. They are lay hands on the sick so they will be healed. Not they might be healed. They will be healed. We've seen many healings. We've seen, we prayed for people and they didn't get healed. That's not on us. That's on the people receiving the healing. So once we get over that fact, that's like, oh, well, we'll just continue to pray. We can't be rejected because God says we're accepted. So if we go up to someone and say, hey, can I pray for you? And they say, no, that's the worst that can happen. What, is that going to hurt our feelings? Okay, the Bible says dust off your feet and go on to the next town. Go on to the next one. It's like, it's like back in the dating years, that's been forever ago for me. Um, you go from girl, hey, you want to go to the dance or whatever it is? And you go to the next one, you go to the next one, and I got rejected a thousand times. And then you don't let it phase you. And that's it. It's the, same, it's the same concept. We need to get over ourselves. Because that's, that's nothing but pride. Oh, they're going to reject me. So? They re a lot of people rejected Jesus. Jesus didn't go, oh, I can't go to the cross. They're going to reject me. What if he had done that? Aren't we supposed to be like him? He says we're not timid. So if we get attacked with timidity, we, come, we attack that thought or that feeling with the word of God. I have made you bold and courageous. So 
I don't agree with you, the spirit of timidity. God has not given me a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Hallelujah. There's so many scriptures on being courageous. Have I not commanded you, says the Lord? Be bold. Be courageous. That doesn't mean go jump off a cliff. That's not courageous. That's just stupid. Praise God. Well, I thought I was done a while back, but hallelujah. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you, Lord. God, we thank you for this word that you've given us, Lord. We praise you. We glorify you. You are the name above all names. God, help us to, to process this word. Father God, thank you for... God, there, there's no such thing as a harsh word if it comes from you, Lord God. God, it's a warning to get ready. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for getting your people ready. Thank you for waking your people up. Thank you for the revival fire that is coming to this nation, to this world. God, we know when the fullness of your glory touches down, Lord God, when we start operating in the fullness of your glory again and do what we're called to do and be. Father God, we know that persecution is going to come with that. But God, we don't have fear of man. We have fear of you. It is better to fear you than man. Because why would we fear man who might be able to hurt our bodies but God who is the purveyor of our soul our very being our everything and what when we come to the realization what can man really do to us can they throw they can throw us in prison there's your prison ministry I say that all the time <laughs> the devil messed up if he throws me in prison I'm just going to start preaching it, what is he going to do kill you to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Present with the Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's nothing he can do to you. Come to that realization. That is a revelation the Lord gave me years ago. Just like the Apostle Paul said, it's better for me to go. He meant die. It's better to die. But it's better for you, it's your sakes that I'm still here so I'm able to preach the gospel. To live is Christ-like and to die is gain. You gain everything when you pass from this earth. Run the race well. Finish well. So many give up right at the end. They don't even see. God, we ask for eyes to see. To see you, to see in the spirit, to see even the dangers that are coming, Lord God. Father God, we don't like seeing and hearing bad things, but sometimes it's necessary to, to know. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, we worship you, we glorify you. Thank you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.